Breaking news! Breaking news! Yo! Man, tell me why my stomach is hurting. I'm gonna go take a shit, right? It's some little ass doo doo. Oh my god. Boy, oh, what the hell? hell no, man, man let's see what we watching today. The dangers of smuggling they don't show on narcos, man. Shh. You better show me now because I was just finna apply for the cartel. Just got Tracy. Quite high Tracy. Okay, not a gentleman's passport. So I'll ask him if he's had any contact with drugs if he's used or so. I'll take it from there. The Yo, reality is have you guys seen of the narcos? Cause personally, that shit fine. It's a pretty good show. I watched a little bit of it. I don't think I finished like the whole thing because like I already knew like what the outcome was gonna be, so I stopped watching it. I lost interest in it. But pretty good show, guys. Think I should watch should it. Be pretty far away from the one they show on TV. Movies tend to portray smugglers as a dangerous but cool affair, even when it gets brutal. But the life of a narcotic smuggler is anything but cool. You start low, you hardly make any money, and you risk ending up in jail or even dead at the hands of rival cartels. Smuggling is a losing game. Even Pablo Escobar ended up dead one day after his 44th birthday. I am extremely lucky to be alive. In my opinion, the risk is not worth it. Bro, have game. you guys ever thought about that? Cause like I was a badass kid when I was um a couple years ago when I was young, <laughs> talking like I was thirty years old. But a couple years ago, like when I was like uh, teenage or like when I was just still like a little kid, whatever, dude. Like I never realized like how much dangerous stuff I actually got myself into, and nothing really has happened ever to me. Like nothing has happened. It's it's amazing. The consequences. <laughs> Far exceed the rewards. Going to prison in a different country is way worse than the reward than if you did make it. Let's explore how smuggling really works and the many dangers we don't think of. Get trained in less than Hit a year with another at ad. Universal Technical Institute as an auto or diesel technician. Y'all, y'all gonna struggle struggle with these ads like I am. White powder smuggling doesn't start or end with the kingpin making sketchy deals. In fact, it's an endless list of processes, transactions, and people involved. It all starts in three countries, Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia. This is where coca leaves can be farmed. The farms will generally be in rural locations out in the countryside um, where they will grow the coca bushes. But before coca leaves can be sold to consumers in the US and Europe, they have to be processed into cocaine hydrochloride. First, the leaves are ground into coca paste. Hey. paste you guys did not get no inspiration to be a drug dealer from me. <laughs> not from me. This then gets converted into coca base in special containers, and then, in a lab, it becomes cocaine hydrochloride. Several chemicals are used in the process. Acetone, hydrochloric acid, potassium permanganate, sodium carbonate, and many others. But these aren't easy to buy. There are people assigned specifically to ensure a steady stream of the necessary chemicals. We had to uh, basically make a fake company, a uh, fake profile, have a number in order just in order to be able to go to these big chemical companies to then buy the chemicals from them because they wouldn't sell to just anyone from the public you had to be from a business lots of people in the job end up arrested and thrown in jail as the authorities watch closely for phony companies but once the lab has all the chemicals it's ready to process the final version of white powder and ship it the cocaine once it's been processed in the lab will be transported to probably down to the coast normally or to the the ports or also the capital, should we say, for sale. So the first people involved in making white powder are the farmers. They are paid notoriously low wages for dangerous work. They have to cultivate one acre of bushes for just one kilogram of white powder. In Yo, Columbia, who came up with this idea? Like, who invented $1. cocaine, cents man? Per kilogram. In Peru and Bolivia, Coco. they get $3. Somehow, a kilo of white powder ends up costing upwards of $50,000 in Europe. That's only the first of many inconsistencies and unfair aspects of smuggling. Hey man, I'm a L drug dude. Cause me personally, I would have I would have ran with the stuff or I'd be doing the stuff. <laughs> 
Colombian jungles, one kilogram of Coke costs $2,200. Once God. it reaches the ports, it's sold for five to $7,000. In Central America, it gets to $10,000. And in Mexico, it climbs again from $12,000 in the south and $16,000 in the north from where it's shipped to the US. A kilo of white powder in the US costs from $24,000 to $27,000 and the price doubles in Europe. And in Australia, it can get to a staggering $200,000. There's an ironic twist here. The price of white powder increases as it moves from custom to custom, but its purity decreases. Coke usually leaves Colombia at around 85% purity, but reaches the US at about 60. At what retail level, this can get as low as 30%. The other 70 can be anything from baking soda to rat poison and fentanyl, both of which can kill. So not only are you exposing yourself to many dangers associated with white powder, but you're risking your life as you never know what's inside a gram of Coke. But customers are not only the ones taking the risk here. First, everyone involved in transforming coca leaves into the final product face a long list of health hazards. Yo, I don't get what's the big deal of like the war on drugs. I mean, they're already lost, but like, Obviously, people are going to keep doing it and find a different way to... I just don't... If you're not hurting no one, if you're not bothering no one, do do your own thing, man. I don't know, like, what's the big deal about this stuff. Acetone, hydrochloric acid, and many other chemical substances can lead to explosions and various health issues, especially as these people work in makeshift, unsupervised labs, the cons of doing Breathing it work. all in. Of course, they also face the risk of prison time if their lab gets discovered by the authorities. But it's the smugglers that are most exposed from this perspective. Smugglers face a plethora of risk and live in constant fear of their lives. With a route so long and treacherous, it's easy to imagine that there are thousands of people working and smuggling all the time. As time passes and the authorities become more eagle-eyed, smugglers get more creative. So the cocaine would be put into liquid and then into liquid latex, which would then be set in sheets, very thin sheets. We would then put those latex sheets into the ground sheets of tents. Yo, you know, so I'm we... still confused on like when they transport it, how does it lose like its, um, its potency? Like, I'm confused. Like, how does it just lose, like, automatically 25% of its, you know what I'm saying? It's make you get high. Uh, I don't understand that. Like, do they just cut it with something to save some for themselves or, like, we don't employ save some money or something? Basically, to go and collect the tent after it had been impregnated with the thing. Uh, to then bring that back through right customs. There. From Colombia to Ecuador to California to London, these tents would pass through customs undetected for a while. You see, when it comes to narcotics smuggling, the big bosses never get their hands dirty. Want a second income stream? Second app! you can download an app from the app store, then you can now build a They order the hits, the sketchy deals, and the transportation methods, but never really risk their skin. As smugglers climb the ranks of the cartels, they hire young, expendable people to do the dirty work. That mm. way, it's them going to prison if the shipment goes awry. Many people are recruited to carry out dangerous shipments while on vacation. They don't know what they're up against and the smugglers use this to their advantage. They sell the deal as a quick and easy job that will earn you a hefty sum of cash at the end, but they know the chances are you'll end up in prison. They are in vacation spots and they're there to recruit expendable people. So really take it to heart. They're not gonna pay you enough. They don't care about you. You are not special. You are not the smartest one that's ever tried this. Documentaries like Banged Up Abroad give a pretty accurate rendition of this. The first line of smugglers, the ones actually carrying the white powder on planes, are usually the first ones to fall. But for the cartel kingpins, the show goes on. They're also interested in the big shipments. As far as other forms of uh, smuggling cocaine, obviously um, the cartels use containers, shipping containers, to bring in the larger shipments of cocaine, i.e. Uh, tons at a time. This is normally done using corrupt port officials at both ends. Yeah, so I was it's just going to say this, man. Like, there's no way, like, a bunch of higher-up officials not in this, because I for sure the war on drugs would have been stopped right now you know what i mean but i feel like a lot of people are in the drugs themselves and that's the people that's in like our presidents and people that's in have higher power so those motherfuckers missing a brain cell man I, i'm telling you 
the movement of the cocaine. So there's the cartel members who secure the deals and bribe the officials. Then there's all the people that take the bribes and make sure the shipment goes undetected. Here comes yet another danger. When one customs official falls, they usually take everyone else with them. When it went wrong, the police officer or the customs agent involved would always roll over and inform on all of the other people involved. <laughs> it's once the again the said, first line. Hey, I'm not the only one going the down. You're going down with me. As kingpins bribe government officials and assure their men don't go to prison. But cartel members aren't completely safe either. In fact, they live in constant fear. This is for two reasons. I was going to say paranoia. One, they always risk being arrested. If you've made a mistake and the kingpin doesn't protect you anymore, or if you're just starting out and you're not considered important, you're like a sitting duck, waiting to be arrested and used as a scapegoat for your boss's crimes. Two, rival cartels. You see, and this this is why, like, I don't get why people go into this time. I mean, unless it's like a family, like, you're already in the family, you know what I mean? They don't have to worry about as much. But, like, you're a stranger dude trying to help another stranger out. And you're most likely going to get the, the bad end of the deal. Always at war. Coca territories are limited, and new cartels are always popping up or splitting it's not worth older, it. bigger cartels after there's been an internal fight. So there will be plenty of turf fights where two or more cartels claim one territory. These never get solved nicely. They're bloody and involve lots of retaliation. An eye for an eye, an eye for an eye. It never seems to end. And sometimes even cartel members' families and other civilians die as a consequence. Yeah. And remember how Pablo Escobar died in a shootout on a rooftop in Colombia? Yep, not even the biggest bosses are spared and for many years during which they make millions they're in a constant state of panic i've been in prison with people there capos from the sinaloa what does cartel, that mean? uh bosses from the, the colombian cartels and even when they were the, in their heyday making millions the amount of fear and paranoia that they had to contend with you know people trying to kill them people trying to take their business from them yeah you know, and in the end, what did they end up with? They ended up going to prison for a long time and losing all of it, pretty much. The dangers of smuggling are never ending, and they go from the bottom to the top. But the long process of white powder smuggling isn't over yet. If the coke gets safely to where it's supposed to get smuggled, it has to be sold to dealer networks and then to everyday, everyday consumers. consumers. All of the cocaine we pay for up front using various different money transfer agencies like Western Union, MoneyGram, we would always try and keep the transfers under a thousand pounds at a time. Now it's like ten thousand to, to or nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine. Obviously we could really you can't use one person more than two or three times in a month. Once again, expendable people are used by the cartel to make the transfers. So if something goes wrong and the police decide to investigate the transfer, their name will come up and they will end up arrested. We had some underground money transfer agencies that were a bit corrupt, <laughs> should we say, that was um, allowed us to send more than was registered. After the whole buying process is over, a full estimate can be made. Only one to two percent of the money goes to the farmer. The cartel mm. takes 40 and the rest goes to the many street dealers. But no one, absolutely no one, is spared the risk. Put in a few words. The problem with drug trafficking is you're only going to be able to do it for so long before you get caught. Mm. In the operation that I was carrying out, we tried to keep the number of people involved Small, the, to yeah, the smallest tight possible. Circle. Because obviously the less people know, the less chance of it that somebody's going to turn informant or betray you. At one point or another. Guys, also, one... never have a odd number group of friends. The reason why I'm saying this is because usually the two will go against the one. It's like everyone's starting up with each other. Like everyone in the whole group is talking crap on each other and becoming backstabbing and everything like that. But always have an even group of friends because one's going to feel left out. Person from the smugglers network will be arrested. It won't be long until the police turn them and they become informants. Then it's all a dominoes game. I was arrested in Ecuador in 2005 and ended up, ended up getting sentenced 12 to 12 years, years in prison man. in Ecuador. Um, I was diagnosed with complex PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, after having seen so much mayhem yeah, yeah. and death and destruction in prison in uh, Ecuador. Yeah, the ordeal doesn't even end with prison. Whether you're there for just a few years or life, prison can be an extremely tough place, and you can even lose your life in there. Former cartel members turned informants sometimes lose their lives after a cartel boss orders a hit on them for betrayal. 
corruption, greed, and a never-ending lust for power and money keeps the narcotics it smuggling stop, trade up and Same running. With smuggling comes arrest, shootouts, death, and the death of loved ones. In my opinion, the risk is not worth the, the reward. The consequences far exceed the rewards. Smuggling is a tough, lose-lose game that is often painted as an exciting job in the movies and series. It'll only end up with you being captured or killed uh, as the effect of that. Hey man, W video, what do you guys think? Please don't do this, guys. It's not worth it. Like the guy said, the, the risk of what you gotta do is not worth the reward. And plus, you only get a small chunk of change for all that work you're doing. Like, you know what I mean? I don't think it's worth it. Everyone's a, sis uh, a slave to the system. There's no escaping the matrix. We're just going to have to live with it. All right, man. Thank you. Bye-bye.